Hey guys, welcome back to the Mike Force Podcast. I want to do an intro and start doing this as a part of our operating procedures because some of the people that we bring on, you don't know who they are. There's no context and we get into the conversation, but I want to tell you about our guest in advance. Today we have Jeff Frazier on the podcast. Jeff and me actually joined the Army on the same day. He ETSed after a four-year enlistment, did a whole bunch of stuff, graphic designer, ran all over the country, and at one point decided that he wanted to help Haitians overseas, and so he started volunteering. That volunteering led him to being captured and held captive for 43 days. In fact, today, today, April 12th, is the anniversary of his 43-day captivity. Why is that significant? Well, as you know, Haiti has fallen apart. And I think there's a lot of national security implications of not paying attention and addressing potentially the issues that are going on in Haiti. Because if we don't, just like right now, where Florida is putting their coast on lockdown from immigrants because they're repatriating them and sending them back to Haiti, we're going to be dealing with this problem for a very long time. This isn't across the seas. This isn't in the next town over. This is happening in our own backyard. So he shares his story, his experience in captivity, and also his perspective on why paying attention to Haiti is important to our national security interest. Without further ado, our podcast with Jeff Frazier. Thanks, guys. Well, Jeff, thanks for making the trip, man. Came all the way from Florida, right? Thanks for having me. Yes, I did. Where, where are you at in Florida? Miami? Boca. Boca. Just north of Miami. So is that Boca Raton? Home. Yeah. Okay. I have some contracting buddies that live there. Damn. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know the. Details. That's a strange place for a contractor to live. It is like I only know um, his call sign. I guess I can say his call sign. Slovak is his call sign. Okay. I imagine that's tethered to his real name, or or maybe not. He sure. looks like a mini Viking. So um, <laughs> you'll have to introduce me. But I, I like. I actually. I think Sean. I think Sean Ryan lived in Boko for a period of time. Okay. Because he was going in and out of Columbia, maybe. Okay. But um. You're a Utah boy. You grew up in Utah, huh? No, uh, L.A. Really? Yeah. So born. Oh, in, you you just went through maps. So I was born in Provo. Was here for like a couple of days. My yeah. mom was here to have me with where her mom was, my grandma. Then we went. Back you were born to, here in Provo. Yeah. And you've never been? Have you been back? So um, I lived in L.A. I am LDS. Yeah. And so culturally, I'm always going to be tied to yeah, yeah. To Utah, and then. Uh, uh, so uh, real quick kind of backstory, parents divorced early, you know, um, that whole thing. Um, unfortunately my mom married an abusive dude. He ended oh, up no. killing her later. So I end up in this, really? Like, yeah. I end up in this very angry kind of youth state. Yeah. Uh, trying to straighten out my act. So I end up in Provo. Yeah. Just kind of sowing my wild oats a little bit. Yeah. I uh, worked for my, uh, cousin. Uh, and then, uh, kind of got sick of being an idiot and joined the army from here. So oh wow! It's like you know what, and I always joke it took a literal army to straighten me out. Yeah, know? but as you know, the army will beat some discipline in India. And yeah, luckily but that worked. Out. We we just found out by the day that we joined the army so at the same crazy. time. So crazy, and uh, we had an original ETS date of the same time. Yeah, which is crazy. It's so crazy. I don't it, think I've ever met anybody except people who are going through with me that are done. Yeah, that. so and you we were two nineteen company away. Yeah, yeah, two nineteen. I was one nineteen. Charlie Company one nineteen. Echo Company two nineteen. What was you got? Was it Hell's Kitchen or was it like? That sounds. So there's a couple. It was like uh, House of Pain, Hell's Kitchen. House of Pain sounds really familiar, but you know, yeah, they actually asked me. So I ended up becoming a graphic designer later. That's totally yeah. different. But uh, my first sergeant had me painting things all over the place. I'm trying to remember. I just remember a big, dude, big kind of drill sergeant with a mustache and a cigar. <laughs> I'm not sure what our mask got. Yeah. Like, Hell's Kitchen sounds familiar. That's major pain. That's, right. <laughs> that's right. major right. pain. Um, anyway. Well, that's interesting because you had a you had a start early on in the army. Yeah. And you know, we're we're podcasting you because of your expertise very specifically about Haiti. Yeah. And I'm interested in why you're an expert in Haiti, because there's experts in everything across the the globe, but you don't find a lot of experts in Haiti. Right. I mean, Haiti, it, <laughs> Haiti's always had problems. I mean, uh, I just talked about this recently where in the 80s, the 82nd Airborne Division mm. was going to conduct an op, suited up. I think they even airborne rigged in route. Mm. They rigged their chutes 
and we're about to jump in and I believe 30 minutes out, that probably is a gross exaggeration. It's probably <laughs> it's like, pretty tight. yeah. Um, it's like when they're in the door right, and then right, they right. get the, the lights green and it goes red and they're red. like, oh. <laughs> um, but they, they were gonna do this major jump and then uh, both at the time, Jimmy Carter and another gentleman, I wanna say Muhammad Ali, but it wasn't Muhammad Ali, it was probably Jesse Jackson or something. Uh, oh no, no, it was Colin Powell. They, they negotiated a ceasefire. Hmm. and we wanted up pulling out. Where did this passion, before we get into the meat and potatoes sure. of, of Haiti, where did this come from? Sure, so uh, I've been involved with Operation Underground Railroad for a long time, since the very early days. Are you familiar with this mm -hmm. nonprofit? Yeah. Uh, That's local here, right? It started it is, in Utah, yeah. yeah. It did, it did. Um, and so got the the bug to, to be an advocate, donor, kind of activist with that circa 2014. Mm. Uh, I was running an advertising agency. I was broke, but I could give my time. And so we did their first websites and that kind of thing. As uh, my career progressed, I got more free time to be more involved, more active. Um, we started getting operational. And so I would try to help and contribute however I could. And Haiti was this Rubik's cube that no one could ever really figure out. Right. And uh, I raised my hand and said, all right, we'll we'll go try to figure it out. Right. And uh, child exploitation in Haiti is a horrific thing. And, and we could talk about that in detail if you like. But it's rooted in poverty and it took a while to figure that out. But in the process of wanting to solve that mystery, I moved my family from California to South Florida. And so I get to Boca because it's close to the airport and has decent schools for the kids and started traveling down to Haiti around 2019. My first trip was in 2018, 2019, I started getting more serious. Uh, then COVID happened, I was blocked for a little while, and then I was on the first flight back down, the literal first flight back down to Haiti uh, once it was opened back up and learned the language and started digging in, trying to figure out what the problem was. You, you, um, I mean, originally the mission was child exploitation which is yeah. the focus of that nonprofit, mm -hmm. and just paint us a picture of what that looks like so initially you feel like you're going to go and uncover these criminal rings in haiti and there that does exist but the much more uh, significant issue is poverty related child exploitation they have a thing that they call rest of ECA, which is a French for stay with. It's a cultural dynamic where poor, really poor families send their kids to slightly less poor families uh, to live a better life, right? Maybe go to school, maybe eat, right? Mm. And what started out maybe 150 years ago as a decent uh, cultural solution for something has turned into what you could imagine is a essentially a, a, a housemaid who does sexual favors for the housemaid, right? Uh, and worse, right? And so that culturally acceptable phenomenon uh, is a big driver in Haiti for child exploitation and several others that we probably don't want to get into too deep, but all of it is poverty driven in Haiti. And so you start to realize, okay, if we're going to address child exploitation in Haiti, we have to lift this whole country. Right. There's a, if you imagine a pyramid, right, on Maslow's uh, hierarchy pyramid, right, you get those people at the very bottom who can't feed themselves or, um, or have shelter. Those are the people who are at risk for exploitation. And so if we could just lift that economy a little bit, right, it's about a 5%, maybe 8% lift, and then you solve all of those, right? Because it's only the most desperate parents who are selling their kids. Yeah. And, and we can all judge the heck out of those parents and say, how dare you? But if you've never been a parent who's had to decide between your child living or dying because of food, you have to either lose your life or lose your virtue, you're going to want to judge those people very slowly, right? And so rather than judging them, we try to jump in and try to lift this whole country. And so in parallel to my work with Operation Underground Railroad, we started our own nonprofit called Stimpak, which essentially just lifts, seeks to lift Haiti however we can. And there's a number of ways to do that. Yeah, a lot of the things that we think are cultural are typically, especially the, um, the real issues like child exploitation come from socioeconomic issues, less 
the cultural phenomenon or the religious phenomenon yeah. is typically, hey, these people are vulnerable as a population because they're poor and they're desperate yeah. and they're being taken advantage of by people who have more advantage in that particular country. Um, I saw that in Africa. I, I remember being in uh, Afghanistan and sending sit reps, like trying to articulate what we were seeing because it mattered in trying to shape hearts and minds mm -hmm when we were looking at children behind the veil being exploited. Yeah. I mean, they were like, well, you want us to build rapport with this guy, but he's literally raping a little yeah. boy. Yeah, And we don't have, I mean, we're not going to be able to do that unless we address it. Yeah, um, Because these men, these Americans are not gonna sit in this room and come to some agreement or term when they know that's happening. And we kind of ignored that. There was like mm -hmm. a, ooh, let's just push that out. Let's just not talk about that. Don't ask, don't tell. Yeah. And we'll focus on the the, the, the tactical issue. Yeah. Um, when you guys deployed into Haiti with the idea of, particularly your, your nonprofit, yeah. of growing, um, I imagine it has to do with giving you more opportunities and growing economic stabilization in some way. Yeah. How do you start? in Haiti. I mean, Haiti is like, I imagine there's no cash crops. There's no large economic incentives. Um, they don't have, they're not sitting on a ton of oil and mm. gas. Like what, what, what's the start point for you? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'll tell the story how I started it and then maybe get to where we've landed. Uh, and so I'm a big believer in you just start, right? And let's go in and make some mistakes. And we most certainly did do that. I think we started with, hey, let's just be Santa Claus, right? Let's show up to uh, orphanages and, and find families who are in need and just start handing out free stuff, right? Free clothes or remember we did uh, shoes was our first kind of Santa Claus game, right? I raised a bunch of money, uh, some of it self-funded. and We show up with a ridiculous amount of shoes from Walmart. We cleared out every Walmart in the Boca, Fort Lauderdale area, tons of them. We go down, we give out the shoes. And then I asked the locals, hey, we just give you a bunch of shoes. Where would you have bought those had we not given them to you for free? And they kind of motioned down the street. There's a street side kind of corner tabletop vendor, right? And then I did the math on what kind of business that guy normally does. And by rough estimation, I just wiped out probably a third of his annual revenue in one trip, which was probably double his margin. Right? I just wrecked that guy. Right? Yeah. He's effectively out of business. And we're talking a couple hundred bucks likely. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, it was probably two grand okay. right? in, in shoes that we had brought, maybe three. And then our next trip was to bring back a bunch of medicine right, to help all these kids in need. Where would you have gotten your medicine? Another tabletop dude, right? And systematically, we were gonna wreck this whole village. The entire economy would have been destroyed by us. And that's a representation of much of US foreign aid. Interesting, oh yeah. my God. So you can just destroy the, the Haitian economy that way. Yeah. So luckily- By giving won. away yeah. these staple basic needs that are literally part of an ecosystem. That's right, so because it's an ecosystem, if you take out pieces of it, you just break it, right? Yeah. Economies are cycles, right? The value changes hands. And wow. you, if you stop that system, it breaks, right? And so that's represented in Haiti globally. So what do you do, right? And so we started coming up with things that are much more effective. And we developed this um, ideology we call GMBO, give nothing but opportunity. So the only thing you can give away is something that has no value unless you do something with it. Mm -hmm. So what is that, right? So one of the things that we did under GMBO is we give out trees, because it has no value by itself. It's a tiny little tree, right? But if you plant it, you cultivate it, it can become high value, especially if it's a fruit tree, right? So we do a lot of that. So we've plant, planted hundreds of thousands of trees and we target these uh, villages along the border because the border uh, kids are particularly hungry and they're uh, targets for what we call the busco and the recruiters that come across from the DR to get them and bring them and sell them or traffic them in the DR. Uh, and so we started planting all these fruit trees in these areas and uh, hope that over the next few years, we can make a serious impact in the amount of food that they can provide for themselves and by implication, far less susceptible to trafficking. We believe that we're starting to see the indications that that's been successful.
So that I think that's representative of the kind of thing that you can do specifically for the child exploitation issue. So how do we then uh, broaden that uh, philosophy to the whole country? Because not everybody can can grow mangoes, right? Uh, so to answer your question, agriculture is a big component, right? And there's a, a number of kind of technocrat. So the term technocrat in development world is uh, the philosophy that if they if they just knew how to do it better, that would solve all the problems, right? And it, you could hear the sarcasm in my voice. It's more than just that, right? Of course, that's a part a part of it, right? And and Haitians do need a lot of education around how to commercialize their agriculture, and that's great. But it's not the solution, right? And there are there are no silver bullets except for one, and I'll tell you in a minute. But agriculture is part of it. Manufacturing is part of the economic. Uh, boost one a component that we are a huge proponent of is tech services right so think of call centers uh is just a services component but tech services is more like it programming right turning them into the next india right uh, because they're a lot closer that makes sense yeah yeah and wh what's the disparity between haiti and the dominican republic <laughs> and why is like why is the dr seemingly staying out of the news yeah. for all the issues that I know exist in the DR. And then Haiti is seemingly the bastard stepchild that's not getting any support from yeah. the DR. And, and 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 how you talked about it where there's more exploitation, people being pulled across. You always hear about it that way. That's their, their partnership. Yeah. And that's their marriage, which seems toxic. Yeah. Uh, Dominicans look at Haiti kind of like Americans look at Mexico, mm. right? It's uh, they're they're causing their problems, right? Mm. Um, and so why is that, right? So historically, I'll give you the 30 second version. Uh, you've got France uh, who brought all the Haitians over as slaves, incredibly fruitful uh, slave colony. It was made France rich, right? That's Napoleon era. And you've got Spain that had the other side, right? And when the Haitians awesomely overthrew their captors, right? They're the first uh, black republic in the world, right? They overthrew their captors and were free. That uh, was a big problem for the rest of the world. They kept their freedom, but nobody liked that. Mm. And so they got embargoed, right? So that wrecks their economy for a hundred and something years. And worse that, than that, uh, they owed a debt so Napoleon comes back and says, okay, I've got a whole bunch of boats. I'm going to come and wreck you now unless you agree to this debt, right? And I believe it was something like $100 billion uh, in that era of money. And they, I don't remember the year they finished paying it, but it's fairly recent. It's like the 1960s or something, right? It wow. took forever to repay that. And that's the government, right? And so they were just absolutely hamstrung for a long time. The U.S. embargoes them. Also, everybody embargoes them, so they can't do any business. Uh, and then... In the meantime, the DR has Spain as their sponsors, right? And they're hooking them up. They get their independence, but it's a friendly independence, right? Mm -hmm. So that that parallel path diverts significantly because of that embargo. So they have a fund stream of revenue coming from Spain directly, which is funding basically their disconnected yes. existence. Well, and they get to play with the region, right? Yeah. They get to trade and with the US and be friends with everyone. Meanwhile, Haiti's just getting wrecked. And then all sorts of other things happen. You, uh, the Americans come and invade uh, in 1914, I think is mm. when it is, uh, and kill thousands. I mean, it's a true invasion. Uh, we did all kinds of destruction down there. Uh, the, the very embarrassing part of our history, right? We finally pull out and we just keep kind of not doing the right thing by them, right? And I don't want to oversimplify it. All these stories are, are rich and complex, but they're not good for Haiti and that we continue to cause harm. Yeah, then they have an earthquake, a natural sure. catastrophe that destroys everything that they fragilely built in place. And hurricanes. Hurricanes, and, and it, they're just getting decimated. Yeah. Um, we get to a point where you wind up in a very precarious circumstance. Your own story of survival with mm -hmm. getting rolled up and imprisoned. What's the lead up to that? And then how does that happen? The specifics of it, of it happening? So um, I painted the picture uh, to you that we're trying to learn how to lift all of Haiti. 
and we have a lot of these kind of um, cute sayings like give nothing but opportunity and we want to build the economy and take all these long-term approaches. We don't want to put band-aids on things. And I've been saying all those things for a long time, but last year, probably, probably 18 months ago, things took a particularly terrible turn with the gangs taking over to where it was impossible to do anything. You couldn't do any of these kind of long-term uh, pretty ideas that we'd come up with the, the b potential benefactors of all of our programs many were going to be dead before we saw the fruits of those labors. Yeah. So I started scratching my head and, and thinking, you know what, I think we need to turn our focus a little bit and just feed some of these people and get them some water, right? Because some of these groups that we pay attention to are 72 hours out from a lot of them dying, right? The gangs had shut off the port at that time, which meant no fuel or food can get in. The fuel is how they pump the water out of the wells, right, out of the ground with their wells. Uh, and so all these very acute issues started popping up. And so we turned our attention toward just doing food distributions. Mm -hmm. right? We'll just get food and water and cooking oil and that kind of thing out. We partnered with a number of organizations to do that. And that's what we were doing when I got kidnapped. So you're trying to do good. Sure. And um, obviously you stand out in Haiti. Yeah. Um, everybody that I've talked to who's been to Haiti, especially fellow former action guys who've been to the worst places in the world, including um, Africa, have said Haiti's about as bad as it gets. Mm -hmm. It's one of the worst places. Um, when you get kidnapped, what was the incentive for the kidnappers? What was the whole point of it at all? I imagine kidnapped for ransom. I don't know this, the details of this, but why were you kidnapped? Where were you held? And how did you fare? Yeah. So the reason I got kidnapped is because I went through a gang territory and it's a known gang territory and I knew it. Um, so typically, so if you imagine Haiti is kind of shaped like your hand, right? And, and this side is DR and Haiti is here. You kind of go like this. Um, the airport is right here by my, my crinkle. And there's a place just south of my thumb called Jacques Mill. Mm -hmm. And I needed to get from the airport on the top of my thumb to Jacques Mill on the bottom of my thumb, right? And normally you would fly. But because of the gang activity, most of the uh, flights were shut down, right? There was a couple of privates that were still flying, but they were booked out three months and I needed to get food in there fast, right? So what do you do? So we would make deals with gangs to pass. And I had some experience at this. We dealt with lots of gangs in, in the past. You make sure that they got hooked up somehow, maybe get some of the food and some of the water. Maybe they just want the credit for the, the, the food distribution. I don't care, right? I don't need any credit. I'm not wearing any logos or anything. Just get us in. And so that was kind of our habit. There was a particularly problematic gang in a place called Martisan. Uh, Martisan is, is the northern uh, coast of Haiti, but going from east to west. And I knew we had to pass through there. And so I had our security guys make a deal with that gang to let us pass. And that's fine. They're fairly um, predictable tolls to go through there. We plan to pay a toll. My stupidity and, and arrogance was to not double check that deal um so we go through that we pay our toll it's fine we do our distribution in jacques mel successfully it's fine we come back two three days later to pass through and we go through this uh toll booth which is that's a stretch to call it that it's a it's a blue umbrella with a bunch of dudes sitting underneath with you know ar-15s and ak-47s uh, we pass it just fine. We get maybe 200 meters from safety. This is kind of no man's land era be or area between Martisson and Port-au-Prince proper. It's, it's no man's land for good reason. Like there's no one there, right? Um, in an otherwise heavily dense urban area. So it's kind of a spooky thing, right? And we can see it and a bunch of motorcycles roll up alongside of us, eight dudes, four motorcycles, eight dudes, uh, pop out, you know, guns pointed. It was strangely not as loud as you would expect in a kidnapping, right? They just walk up and I wasn't convinced that I was being kidnapped yet. 
because sometimes these gangs are, are our escort. So I'm no stranger to being along with the gangster, right? So I'm hopeful that this is not what it looks like. Uh, and then one of the uh, kidnappers jumps in to the driver's seat. My driver sits on the kind of center console, kind of smashed up against the ceiling. And we flip a UE, and I'm still hopeful. This is the eternal optimist in me, right? So hopeful that maybe we're going down to the checkpoint. Maybe it's a shakedown. They just want more cash. And just before we get to that checkpoint, they go up, which is also south, um, up the hill. And then I know we're being kidnapped, right? And, and the uh, another guy, when another kidnapper, high, kidnapper hopped into the back seat with me, and uh, I'm wearing a, a hat kind of like yours, and he pulls it down over my face and holds it there. And I want to know where I'm going. And so I, I kind of spin my my head underneath the hat, right, so I can see out the window. And I start counting lefts and rights. And with the adrenaline rush, I lost count pretty quickly. Um, and we pull into the uh, to this kidnapper's lair. It's inside a, a walled compound uh, that used to be a seminary, like a, I think it was Episcopalian seminary. And they uh, they walk me in and shake me down and put me in a cell and I was kidnapped. Were they were you there with other people who had been kidnapped? Was this like a, an operation? This is something obviously they do and they're yeah. they're talented at. <laughs> talented is a stretch, but it's definitely a system. Uh, the room that I was so I was taken with myself and two security dudes, uh, and we were stuck in a room and there were two or three guys already in there uh, on nasty, bloody mattresses. Uh, and I was left in that room for probably 30 minutes. And then this high ranking, one of the guys got beat up pretty good. That was with us because he was hiding a, a ring in his shoe. Because uh, they shake you down, they take all your valuables, right? Um, and then the boss kind of comes in. His name was Chef Jeff. My name is Jeff, but um, so it was his. Chef is uh, Haitian Creole for like chief or boss, right? So he walks in, he yells, blah, which is Creole for, for white, literally white guy, but it really means foreigner, right? Blah, he was so excited to see me, right? Was, Big money. Yeah. Uh, so he pulls me and sticks me in another room. And coincidentally, there's two other Americans, Haitian Americans that are in there. Uh, and, and that's it. At that, no, and one other Haitian dude that was in there uh, when I first walk in. And then uh, to answer your question, another four or five captives come in later that afternoon. And that's kind of the, the starter set. We end up with like, I don't know, 13 of us initially. Wow. And that dwindles down every day, like over time. So I was the last one there. On day 43 of my captivity, I was alone. Uh, day 35, the other, another woman, Stephanie, uh, Haitian American, she gets released. She was awesome. But so then, anyway, I don't know if that is your question. That's how they taper them off. Right? Are they, they have a, I mean, they, I imagine what this is, is, is for ransom. They have a bartering system or some kind of negotiations that are, that are had. And then they basically sell you back yeah. to, to civilization. Yeah. If you imagine the deal structure, right. They, their bargaining strength is they can kill you and they threaten that all the time. Uh, but in between killing you and letting you go is lots of other terrible, right? And so they're they're leveraging that uh, reality and through, you know, photos or phone calls or videos that they're sending to your family or your negotiators, right? Uh, to try to get you to pay and pay again and pay again. Many of those families paid, you know, four or five times. What is your, um, what's your mindset at this point? And are you defaulting to any kind of tactics, any kind of training? any understanding of what's taking place? Like, wh what are you going through mentally? So the first few days, <clears throat> I thought I had some get out of jail free cards. You know, I had enough uh, contacts in Haiti that I thought that I would have enough leverage to get out without paying and, and quickly. And about day three, day four, I knew I those didn't work. Right? I'd, I'd played those get out of jail free cards and they failed. So now I got to figure out what I'm going to do. And um, you're, you're essentially doing what we learned in the army, which is 
give out as little information as you can, as slowly as you can, and try not to get hurt, right? Um, and so we play that game, you know. Um, and luckily, my wife was getting really good counsel from really smart people. You know, we think that you get kidnapped and the FBI shows up and they handle the whole thing. None of that happens, right? This is a level four do not travel country, right? They, there's Their hands are tied. There's no allocated assets to no. help you out of this. Situation. No, there, there's a little bit of a guide on the side kind of thing. And they're sharing intel with you. Like, hey, here are the other people who are captive. Here's, here's what they had to do. Here's how they got. Like, so you get some intel sharing. But they're not running your your negotiations. They they can't even make any choices or recommendations to you. Uh, it, so my wife was on her own. It's a private endeavor it to is. get you out. It is. Yeah. Um, was there a particular organization that you were able to utilize, or is it your just wife just freelancing at this point? She freelanced it, right? So networks. Luckily, we've got a powerful network that were extremely helpful, and those are those are my heroes, right? That, that stepped up in uh, a huge way for me. So uh, she accessed uh, one friend who led us to another, led us to another, and we end up with this guy who was absolutely amazing and was a total volunteer for six weeks. You know, and this is a all encompassing thing. Like you're, you're doing it all day, every day, right? It's calls after calls after calls. You're calling the gang, gang's calling you back. They're threatening this, you're trying to, achieve this you're leveraging assets in country you've got to get a, a Creole speaking direct negotiator right like organizing that whole thing is incredibly complex yeah right and so my wife was doing all that uh, luckily with the help of some of these guys and you're hanging on by a thread the entire time no that's not accurate um you know that you, you go in waves right you've got um you've got good days right that aren't aren't horrible right where you get a chance to, you know, draw something on the wall with a, a rock that you found, right? Like, well, what's talk to me about a good day versus a bad day? What's what was, what was one of the best days? What was one of the worst days? Um, so day twenty eight um, was our first ransom attempt. Uh, so we're we have you call it an accord, right? That's French for an agreement, right? You have a deal, and they were supposed to let me out. And luckily for my team, they, they had agreed on a really small number. I was proud of them for that. I'm proud of them now. Uh, at that point, I just wanted them to pay fast and get me. What well, ballpark? Right? What, are you, what are you looking at? I probably shouldn't say that, right? Uh, oh, because of the. Yeah, I don't want to establish know the baseline. a baseline. Yeah, I don't want to establish a market. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it's small, right? Um, yeah. If you do it well, it's small. Uh, I just heard uh, a dude on the radio, a YouTuber who got kidnapped. He paid 40K. That's stupid. And he paid it fast, right? Yeah, because that's setting a bad precedent for everybody else, obviously. Right. Price on everybody's head. Yeah. You know, I, I mentioned this on my podcast. The There was a, a group of missionaries, 17 missionaries that got kidnapped a couple of years ago. And that was the first Americans that had really been kidnapped, at least had been publicly kidnapped. And we were all just praying they didn't pay anything. Right. We, we wanted them to come up with some non-monetary solution. Right. And it, that's a horrible thing to ask somebody to do. Right. But I was really hoping that they'd be able to stay strong. Uh, I don't know what happened to them. They they tell an interesting story. But regardless, we were rooting for them to pay small because we knew that that would be the price on my head. Right. And I was going to keep going. Right. And I didn't want a price on my head. And so I'm trying to provide that same service now while I'm kidnapped. Right. I'm mm -hmm. trying to stay strong. I was not nearly as strong as my team was, right? Because I was ready to pay fast and big uh, just to get home. Like that that drive to get home is hard to mm. explain. Like yeah. when when you're stuck and you can't get to your family, you know that they're freaking out for you. Yeah. Like, that's hard to quantify, right? Anyway, so that's kind of the, I forget what your question Best was. Best day, worst day. Oh, so um, worst day. So they pay, um, it's in the evening. And I'm, I'm convinced it's going to work, right? I can, I'm one of the, there's not too many left, right? On, on that day, there's maybe two other dudes on the other side that, uh, in the other room uh, that were there. And then myself and this Haitian uh, woman, Stephanie, and I'm, I'm hopeful that I'm going to get out. So my team pays, I'm kind of mo um, watching it minute by minute, right? It's very exciting, very hopeful. I'm already dressed. They gave me my clothes back, right? Um, 
and I'm ready to go. I have my passport in my pocket. And then uh, maybe eight o'clock rolls around and uh, they walk in and they're screaming, your team didn't pay enough. We wanted to pay more. They, and and I'm asking them in Creole, like, did they pay what they said they're going to pay? Yes, but it's not enough. Isn't that the agreement? The, yes, but it's not, you know, it's, there's no rationale. Of course, so I just yeah. kind of resigned. And we had already planned an escape um, method. And so I just decided right then we we're going to do it that night. And so we did. Um, and we escaped successfully. And then we're recaptured that next morning by a neighboring gang and brought back. And that was my worst day. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. Imagine there was a punishment yeah. for that. Yeah. Did they physically assault you and oh yeah no it was, it was a bad day yeah 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 um, you know, yeah it was bad <laughs> so, yeah you have you have post traumatic uh, disorder from this do you do you do you have flashbacks and moments of like I could like you're seeking respiration I, there's I, there's some visceral things that are happening yeah no I can feel it um, sure yeah of course yeah. Yeah. I'd like to think that the, so the FBI was awesome and they gave us a therapist when we got out. Oh, really? That was a specialist in Haiti kidnappings, right? Wow. So that's a pretty relevant skill set and was super helpful for my wife and I. Yeah, captivity is different than just spikes of cortisol and stress in combat because it's prolonged. Yeah. And then there's this up and down and then you're just constantly, I mean, you're constantly stressed, obviously. Yeah. But there's this constant up and down because you're at the edge of survival. Even when you have good days, you're, it, they're not really good days. I mean, they're like, they're, they're the best you got in a bad circumstance. Yeah. And that could stick with you. I imagine since you know by day, you you nearly have a timeline by hour yeah. broken down. Yeah. Well, let's talk best day. What's the, what was the, <laughs> I imagine it might've been. Definitely getting out. Yeah. That's, getting out. That's yeah. my screaming best day for sure. Uh, and that was a gnarly day. Like, you know, because it had gone bad before, you know, I remember him coming in, uh, we call him bad cop. Uh, he's a horrible human. Uh, comes into the room. I'm by myself. Um, and, you know, no clothes on, you know, he comes in and says, we have an accord. All right. It's incredible. Um, and, you know, I'm stunned because the, the days previous to that were some of my worst, right? The, the days between getting recaptured and released are my worst days by a significant margin. And uh, so I'm telling my, as soon as he says that and he leaves, uh, he, I think he gave me a kind of time frame maybe later in the day. And this is probably 8 a.m., maybe 9 a.m. And... Uh, I'm just telling myself over and over again, it's not real, it's not real, it's not real. Just trying to protect myself, right? Um, you know, it's a trick, right? Anything to keep my brain from expecting good, right? Like maybe three in the afternoon, I get a phone, th they bring the phone in uh, and it's my negotiator. And he says, no, it's real. We've got an agreement. Um, one of the big holdups and the second deal was the um, location for the live exchange. So they're like, hey, fool me once, right? Um, the normal uh, method for Haiti kidnappings is you pay, they come back and get you, and then they bring you to your whoever paid, right? But there's a 30 minute lag there, right? And so my team obviously was not willing to play that game again. So they wanted a live exchange. And so my guy tells me that. I was like, okay, it's live exchange, and we're going to come in to Martisan to come get you with uh, a third-party courier that has kind of safe passage. So it's kidnappers, my team, and then this third-party dude who's essentially playing both sides. And uh, sure enough, like 4 o'clock, they give me my clothes back, wallet again, my passport and uh, put me in the car and drive me down the hill. And a guy uh, with a bag of money comes inside the vehicle and I'm thrilled. It's like, dude, we're really close. And I'm, I'm of course looking around because I, I haven't believed that it's real yet. And trying to find, you know, the chinks in the armor of this whole system. Like, is this gonna collapse at any second, right? And he pulls the cash out, counts it, and he says, hey, it's short by 400 good, which is like 
hundred bucks. I'm like, please don't let this blow this thing up, right? And my the guy the guy counting it, a bad cop who's sitting shotgun. Um, he says, "Sorry, I'm, I'm not letting you go," right? Um, and he's and the guy sitting who the courier says, "Let me go get more money." And bad cop says, "Okay, but we're going back up the hill." Right, which is like devastating. Right, like here we go. Like that's exactly what this guy needed. Right, and I don't even know if it was actually short four hundred bucks uh, or four hundred good, um, but he said it was. So we drive back up the hill. We don't. He doesn't pull me out, put me back in my cell. We stay in the car, which is, you know, somewhat encouraging. And like an hour, the longest hour ever <laughs> goes by. Um, you can hear my voice shaking now. Um, and then we get a phone call and it's the courier who says, I have it, I've got the, the 400 good. And so we drive back down and, and uh, we pull up alongside uh, the road and we're waiting for that courier to show up. We're maybe 100 meters from where the exchange is going to happen. And the way the gangs work down there is I'm with one gang, but there's a different gang that controls the road. So the gang that actually kidnapped me, they handed me off to a different gang, right? So now I'm back down on the road and the chef of that gang comes up to my window, this huge dude, and starts raging at me through the window. He's just trying to intimidate me, just having fun, right? And then in Creole, he's talking to bad cop, trying to make a deal to keep me for a third time. It's like, hey, We'll take them this time. You'll be off the hook for this one, and I'll split the ransom with you for the third one. And I'm freaking out. And he doesn't know I understand him, right? And I'm just thinking as fast as I can, like, gosh, please no. And then it occurred, I, I believe it, it was inspired. Um, I feel like I should try to do a business deal with this guy. I, he needs to see me as a future paycheck, right? Uh, maybe a long-term paycheck. And uh, so I, I engage him and said, hey, aren't you the one that I pay the tolls to when I come by next week, right, or, uh, for our next food distribution? And he flips and he says, yes, yes I am, right? You call me, you pay me every time. If you do that, I'll keep you safe when you come through here. Like all of a sudden he's he's in bolt and I just keep feeding that ego, right? I said, give me your number. He says, put it in your phone. I said, I don't have a phone, you idiot. <laughs> you guys took my phone. So he writes it down on a little piece of cardboard, right? Gives me the phone number and I'm, hopeful that, that that's going to do it. And then my courier shows up and we go And you got enough rapport with him. That they let me go. Like that guy lets me go. I could see the look on bad cop's face. He was afraid of that guy. So that, that guy outranked him, right? And, and he was worried about this whole thing blowing up, right? Like he clearly was concerned. And that, of course, made me concerned, right? It's like, dude, who's in charge of this place? Um, you know, obviously nobody is. Um, and so we go, we drive down, we meet the courier and he didn't even look inside the bag. He just grabs the bag of money and waves me out. And I jump on the motorcycle with two other dudes, the three of us on a motorcycle. We drive, uh, to maybe three, four miles away into Port-au-Prince to kind of, um, safer area. I get into another truck. That truck drives me to the Marriott and there's an ambulance and the FBI and stuff waiting for me there. I'm safe. Jeez. Yeah. It's, uh, it's funny, you know, um, you, I'm sure you can hear the shake in my voice right now talking about it. At the time, I felt fine. Like, I'm sure you had this experience in, yeah. in downrange where, like, you, you just feel like you. But once I got to that parking lot in the Marriott, I just fell apart. Like, yeah. I could barely stand up. Right? Yeah. So this is crazy. Because when you're in it, you're you're surviving, but you've accepted nearly your fate. You're just like... Just is what it is. It is what it is. Yeah, and I've had I've had that feeling on bases that were constantly rocketed or mortared or mm -hmm. bombed, where you know you just get conditioned for it. And then you're like, if a bomb lands on my head, mm -hmm. it lands on my head. I'm not getting under this table again. Yeah. Um, but I could see how when you went into the parking lot of the Marriott, where you knew you were in a safe place. Yeah. And then you could let your guard down because mm -hmm. you had guard up. Um. That's when it kind of let yeah. loose. When did you feel the the sense that you were actually free? Because I know there's yeah. you're still in country, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was there overnight um, and certainly did not feel truly safe. 
you know, I, I looked at everyone in the eyes, read every individual, trying to figure out if they were safe or not. Because Haiti's not a safe place, right? There's you can get through anything, and everyone can be paid, right? Um, I had uh, FBI uh, checking in on me, and but you know, I wanted to see everyone's ID, right, and and make sure I memorized their faces, right? Like, so I wasn't safe, right? And then um, FBI gave me uh, an escort to the airport in the morning. Uh, and, you know, I've reviewed all their security protocols before I'd even let them leave the Marriott with me, right? Because now I know how the gangs operate, right? I know a little bit more about how they, because we, I compared notes with all the other captives, how was, how were you kidnapped? How were you kidnapped, right? So I know a little bit uh, of their MO. So I, anyway, so I never felt safe until I landed in Miami, right? Um, you know, a wave of it when I took off, right? There was a strange thing, and th I think this will be helpful for your audience who, who suffer, suffer from uh, post-traumatic stress injury. Um, I became very aware of my conscious versus my subconscious, right? Uh, my wife and I call it our, my other guy and her other gal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because both had needs, right? And while I could have had this conversation with you very normal uh, the day before I got out, once I got out, I started becoming very aware of the other guy, and the other guy was not okay. <laughs> he was not okay at all. And if I ever said that out loud in those first couple of days, my other guy, my subconscious, would be like, "Yes, we are not okay," right? And I'd have a breakdown or start shaking or you know whatever. Yeah. Luckily, you know, we heal, and and I got way better, way fast with my wife. Right? She's incredible. Uh, impact on my healing journey, uh, along with lots of great tools that we got from our therapist. And yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. You say so you're healed or you're healing, mm. but you certainly haven't forgotten. No, 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 no. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about the gangs in Haiti, because right now, seemingly, people who are watching kind of Haiti unfold, which I, I always feel like Haiti's always been an issue. Yeah. It's just now getting more attention because it's breaking. It's yeah. versus fracturing, yeah. and you have an estimate of two hundred plus gangs, and you, that you, you probably know more about that being fact or fiction. But two hundred gangs, and you know, a breakout of thirty eight hundred prisoners, and you know, all of these gangs um, going to war with each other, potentially cooperating with one another. And then taking over territory. And there's even right now, as of yesterday, negotiations with one of the primary gangs that's doing the most damage and potentially doing a ceasefire based on his terms. Yeah. And it's like this entire country has been taken hostage by gangs. Mm -hmm. And you see this in a breakdown of sovereignty in every single form factor across the world. You see it in Haiti. You see it, I mean, everywhere. They're everywhere that a place has fallen apart, yeah. and the sovereignty of a nation and its security has fallen apart. You see this happening. Um, what is your opinion on the national security implications to our country if we're not addressing this? Because as the crow flies, I mean, this is a couple hundred miles away, right? I mean, this is not far. Yeah, we have Florida locking down with the Department of Homeland Security, surprising enough, that's yeah. on board of basically turning away mm -hmm. and repatriating um, immigrants from Haiti that are, which I find odd as well. Like if you come across the Mexican border as a Haitian, then you're safe and you're free. Yeah. If you come across on a boat seeking asylum, which is legitimately asylum in most cases, sure. um, then you're turned away and yeah. sent back to a hellhole, a sure. war zone. Can you sum it up? What's the experience from, for, from your perspective of that? Um, so let's start with maybe a security solution, right? Uh, so you address the gangs. So the quantity of gangs doesn't really matter. The, the power of those gangs is a more relevant you know, uh, metric to, to address. And the fact that we're even considering letting them be at the table is frustrating. Um, was he the gang? Was that member you're referring to barbecue uh, yeah. Jimmy shows, yeah yeah was that the gang that kidnapped you no but okay. i mean if they're they're in alliance right so yeah. um my guy was oh, i won't say his name because you know i don't want to uh aggrandize him uh, we've got 
enough gang celebrities. I don't want to make this guy more of one. Uh, but they're aligned with uh, Jimmy Barbecue. Um, His name's what? Barbecue. Jimmy Cherize, uh, but He goes by Barbecue. Barbecue? Yeah. Like BBQ. Yeah. Like uh, his mom was a famous uh, uh, chicken barbecuer. Uh, and then he, I think he picked up some of the restaurants early on. But then he became a cop and then flipped. You know, and, yeah. Um, anyway, so um, I, I don't necessarily condemn the effort to negotiate with him. Uh, it, that's a touchy thing. Um, some people would argue that he's a turnable asset and that there is a rational path to security that goes through Jimmy Barbecue. Um, I'm not advocating for that, but it is not irrational. Uh, there are many gang leaders with whom it would absolutely be irrational. So unfortunately, we have the uh, obligation to draw a distinction between somebody who looks like they might be a turnable asset versus somebody who just needs to be decapitated, right? Uh, and lots of slices in between those those two guys. But if you've got somebody who makes commitments and keeps them at least most of the time, uh, and the cost to do business with him is uh, is less than the benefit he provides, maybe you want to think about dealing with that guy. As, as obnoxious as that is, right? Regardless, we have to obtain security there somehow. Uh, there was what we call the multinational security support mission that was supposed to come in about 2,500, 3,500 soldiers from around the world uh, backed by U.S. dollars. Uh, no U.S. soldiers, but they were supposed to come in and restore a uh, peace that appears to be falling apart at this point. And so now we need to be looking at other options to uh, achieve peace because right now we have the opposite of that and the gang is winning. Gangs are winning. Uh, led by barbecue, uh, mostly led by barbecue, right? It's, it's an alliance, right? Just like any alliance, there's competing personalities there. So he's not an autonomous actor, right? Uh, but we're hopeful that we can get something done because it's terrible every day. I get worse news this morning. I was on the, on the, on my phone, uh, trying to see what I could do to help with, um, Jimmy barbecue is attacking the national hospital, um, which is really close actually to where I was dropped off, it, which is horrible. Like if they get a hold of the national hospital, right? Like you gotta be kidding me. Like they, they've already effectively shut down the airport. They've been attacking the palace all week. Uh, it's only a matter of time before that um, continued assault on the airport and the national hospital does what exactly what happened to the national penitentiary. Right. And then they win. And in that case, the worst happened and all those uh, gangsters who were in there got out. Right. And I've been in that that prison before questioning suspects. It's a horrible place. And the dudes in there are evil guys. Uh, and now they're all free. Right. Thousands of them. So there's more more gangsters that got out of that prison than we were planning on sending soldiers in the entire multinational security support mission. Uh, so it's that place is falling apart and that is right off our shores, like you said. And there's many levels of problems that that causes for us, right? As that being in our neck of the woods. A lot of people, I think, have a apprehension to being involved in the world in solving problems outside our borders, right? I'm a nationalist like everybody else. I love America, right? There's nothing that I love more than my freedom that I enjoy here being a soldier. Like uh, patriotism, patriotism is deep inside me, right? But in order to protect the United States, we need to pay attention to things outside our borders. Haiti is one of those places that we need to pay attention to from a national security standpoint. So it affects us uh, from certainly from an immigration standpoint. What I think people don't realize is how active China and Russia is in Haiti against us. Really? Yeah. If in that area, when I was driving around on my last day, right, um, in these in the gangsters or in the kidnappers' uh, vehicle, that I must have seen five Vladimir Putin murals, probably a handful of Xi Jinping murals, right next to their gangsters, right, their gang celebrities, right, uh, huge, like you know, five six feet spray painted on the wall, right. Uh, there's a guy I won't name him. Uh, he's a prominent politician up in the north. Uh, who has been to Moscow several times. Wow. Uh, right. 
if we want another Cuba, I was going to say Cuba. Yeah, this is exactly how you get it. Well, it's interesting because I never thought about it from that perspective. Yeah. But I mean, Haiti is like our neighbor. I mean, they're across the street from our house. Yeah. America being our house, and it's like, you know, we're worried about issues that are going on in Ukraine, in Israel, all over the world, the Middle East, certainly the entire region, but we're not addressing issues that are exist in our backyard. Mm. Um, how do you think this is going to unfold? I think it gets worse before it gets better. You have to, we're just starting to get the attention of the United States, which is nice, right? We're in the news cycle, right? It's terrible that you had to let 4,000 uh, bad guys out of prison to get into the news cycle, but that's happened happening now for the first time in years, right? Where Haiti's actually in the front page. That's one step. But um, did you pay attention to, yeah, you would have been in the same time as me. Remember Srebrenica, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. I think you may need a Srebrenica moment mm. where you get those kinds of massacres that happen, which is a horrible thing to, to require in order for us to, to intervene. But it may be that level of terrible for America to wake up. Mm. The nice thing about Haiti is, is we benefit on both sides. We get to be the altruistic uh, rescuers of millions of Haitians who are dying by the thousands uh, from hunger and violence. And we get to take care of bad guys and help our um, our immigration issues, right? We, we can be 100% self-interested and still come to Haiti's rescue, mm. right? So if you're an altruist and a, you know, a bleeding heart capitalist like me, uh, you can, you can get your cape on and go try to rescue Haiti. If you are wholly self-interested and, and just a, a selfish jerk, you still need to go rescue, rescue Haiti because it's in your best interest to do so. I'm at, okay, so there's a lot. I mean, yeah. there's a lot to go and to talk about. Sure. Um, you have a podcast and you focus on the subject matter of the issues that we're facing as a nation, but also uh, that we're facing in Haiti. Yeah. Talk to me a bit about that and like what is what is the goal in, in that podcast and that endeavor? Yeah, so if you go to stimpak.org, S-T-I-M-P-A-C-K.org, you'll see it was, we have a think tank. That's what my nonprofit. It's part think tank, which is basically just talk about stuff and then part interventional NGO. Uh, so interventionals, we actually go do stuff, we try to fix things, right? And that's everything from building roads to planting trees to uh, negotiating ceasefire to um, building small businesses to helping big businesses in the U.S. Uh, work with big businesses in Haiti uh, and pushing policy, uh, proper foreign policy toward Haiti and talking to Americans on how to, to interact properly uh, from a policy standpoint with Haiti. We do all that. Uh, why would your listeners uh, care? Uh, I, I hope that we'll make it interesting for anyone off the street to jump in and uh, try to help us solve that Rubik's Cube. Mm. Um, like we mentioned before, um, if you are interested in the kidnapping story, my wife and I are gonna, gonna tell that this year. So April 12th was the day I was taken. Uh, and so April 12th this year will be our anniversary, right? In a few days. Whoa. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so we're, we're planning to do this uh, kind of series, uh, 43 Days to Freedom where we'll talk about our kidnapping experience, but then you know, hopefully you'll learn something about Haiti along the way. So we'll try to educate and inform, but uh, also tell an interesting story of uh, what I think is a bunch of heroes of mine uh, that rescued me uh, and um, gave me my freedom back. It should be a very, I mean, it should be mandatory that every NGO that's in a crisis contingency location, which is most NGOs are involved mm -hmm. because they're in a crisis area. Sure. Um, to hear your story, but also all the lessons learned. Cause yeah. I imagine there's so many lessons learned. So many. It's, it's thick. It's thick. You, oh man, you should, I mean, you should write a book. I mean, you should do a documentary. You should we'll see. like all the things, those things are very important because, you know, telling somebody, from an outside perspective about what they should be doing is difficult in this circumstance. But when you yeah. talk about it from being there and surviving, yeah. uh, where many people don't, yeah. I mean, people get killed. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping yeah. to, uh, in this 43 days to freedom thing, we're gonna do it in real time, right? Yeah. So 
and um, we'll talk about the day I was kidnapped on the day that I was kidnapped and we'll, we'll take it as it comes. Right. Um, I, I want to share something with you. I brought yeah, of course. something with, so I mentioned all my heroes, you know, I'm, uh, as you really into freedom, right. Yeah. And, and when I see Haitians, uh, around me in Haiti who don't have that freedom, right. There's something deep inside me that wants to help them be able to make the kinds of choices that we make on a daily basis. You know, I was, I was held captive for 43 days and it was terrible. Right. But yards away from my cell were people who were also being held captive. Uh, they, you know, they walk around outside the cell, they live there, but they have no choices, right? They don't get to choose, uh, to, to worship, right? They don't get to choose to go to work. They don't get to choose to go to the hospital if they need to, right? All the kinds of, uh, things that I believe are central to our humanity, our ability to choose. I believe that's a incredibly important thing to making us human, right? From a religious standpoint and um, my desire to help people. I had heroes that helped me fight for my freedom, right? And that didn't have to. And there's a handful of those in particular. I, I brought this thing. Um, I, when I got back and started to learn about the incredible sacrifices that were made on my behalf, uh, I had a handful of, of men and women that were my heroes, right? And so I, I made them this, this little award and I brought one uh, just to show you. Um, I'm actually going to see one of my heroes tonight, and so I'll give it to him because oh, I, wow. I haven't seen him. Um, he's flying in tonight. Um, but this is so there. It's the Freedom Fighter award of sorts oh that's cool right? man um you know the wings you know um, symbolizing freedom but i'll i'll read the back of it so this guy so it, i taped over his name just because you don't need to know that um this guy the haitian dude um risked his life for me right so he was in haiti at that time and on several occasions put himself at significant risk uh to get me out right and you know, that you know about that right um, oh gosh, I can't read it. <laughs> I'll, I'll sum it up for you. Yeah. My eyes are so bad. You want me to read it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I can. Yeah. I won't read his name. Yeah. Um, his name and says, I believe great men assume responsibilities of which they could reasonably absolve themselves. When you receive the news of my capture, you did not shrink. In that moment and the many to follow, you showed your true character. You made great sacrifices and took significant risk in service of securing my release. You continue to fight tirelessly for my freedom for 43 terrible long days. I will never forget that. Thank you. Forever in your debt, Jeff Frazier. Really cool. Wow. What a really cool token of appreciation for doing that for you. And if it wasn't for them, they, you wouldn't even be here. Oh, dude. Yeah. Um, Amazing. And I didn't, I haven't even begun to talk to you about my wife and it's spectacular. So I bring that up. I, I would love it if your listeners were inspired to be that kind of guy, right? Like that's one of the things I loved about the podcast episodes of yours that I listened to is I walked away inspired by those guys. Like, you know, I, I want to be better because of those guys. And I hope that you'll think about my heroes uh, that same way as, as an inspiration to, to you guys at home. Amazing way to close out a podcast. Thanks for having me too short though there's so many more things to talk about but that's an opportunity for you guys to see jeff frazier and everything he has going on i'll link all those things down below and there's more to talk about because haiti is currently on fire i mean mm -hmm. these are things that are happening right now and there are many security national security implications of not paying attention so um jeff thanks for being on the podcast man thanks for having me thank you so much right. thanks guys Who's gonna change it? There's a